Hello everyone, my name is Bradley and this is Sums Up, a channel about how to survive in the online jungle. Now today I'm going to talk to you about how criminals gain access to sensitive information by attacking the weakest link in the system. <laughs> you. And I'm going to use specific examples of popular methods so that you don't fall for these tricks later. Fraud can only be countered by the power of knowledge, so let's see if you'd swallow the bait. Now, we begin to master the methods of social engineering at a very early age. The ability to get what you want, not by force or threats, but with simple words. Now, this actually starts to develop when you play with children in your local neighborhood. Everyone develops a manipulative skill set in a different way. And that's why some children might grow up to be door-to-door -door salesmen, advertising agents, or even politicians. And the most gifted ones, well, they become hackers. Hackers of people. People are often the weakest link in the system of security measures, and it is they who constantly cause the latter to become rather ineffective. These are the famous words of Bruce Schneiner, a renowned computer security expert. Now, at the turn of the century, the American programmer and a mathematician wrote a book that became the handy book on both sides of the fence, and it was used by both hackers and cybersecurity specialists. Now, it's really hard to argue with Schneiner here. I mean, for instance, do you see this computer? Now I can try and talk to my Mac as long as I like to try and convince it to give me the password. I can say, all I want to do is print one page of a Word document or check my email. But really, no matter how many words I say to my computer, it will not let me in. I mean, yes, I could disassemble it and connect to the hard drive separately. I could try to decrypt the contents of the files, but I certainly can't persuade it. If you want to hack a computer, you need tools. If you want to hack a person? Well, simple words are enough. We're talking about cybersecurity today and how safe people's passwords are. What is one of your online passwords currently? It is my dog's name and the year I graduated from high school. Oh, what kind of dog do you have? I have a Chihuahua Papillon. And what's its name? Jameson. Jameson. Everything I'm about to tell you is not a guide to action, ladies and gentlemen. I'm certainly not encouraging you to find out the information they're not supposed to. I just simply want you to be aware of the danger so that you don't fall prey to scammers if you find yourself in a similar situation. So let's start with telemarketing. But there's more. If for any reason you don't want to keep it, just return it back to us and do get your money back. Now this energetic man that you just saw was actually mistaken for an actor in his childhood, but he wasn't one. Ron Papel actually created the shop at home format itself. And to do so, he had to penetrate the minds of all middle-class American citizens. It's just four easy payments of just $39.99. So in his teens, Ron made his living by selling his father's strange invention, universal vegetable chopping knives. And it was at a Maxwell Street market behind the counter of an old flea market where Ron actually learned how to sell. In the beginning, he was fairly timid and cautious, but then he realizes that the quicker and the more assertive he talks, the faster he can actually convince people to buy his wonderful kitchen utensils. Of course, different people ask different questions, but if you prompt them with questions, you hint or quickly shift their attention from one thing to another, like I'm sure you've all encountered with estate agents, people are very easy to manipulate. And just one scripted conversation really works wonders. Now it was with this very script that Ron appeared on television with in the early 1950s. And unsurprisingly, it was an incredible success. Ron actually managed to sell nearly $2 billion worth of goods throughout his lifetime. And this is an incredible figure. How many people in my audience here today would like to, are going to order one of these machines when it goes on television? Can I see a show of hands? Now here's the thing, a pre-prepared script that precedes questions is often used by scammers who are trying to trick you to share your credit card details or the password to one of your accounts. And this is called pretexting. Pretext is the basis of this method, the starting point from which the deception begins. So look, if I walk up to you in the street and ask for your Facebook password, you'll probably look at me and say, no. But on the other hand, imagine that your profile's been hacked and you want to call the help desk to get your password recovered. Well, would you answer the operator's question as to what your old password was? Most of us would. Okay, give me your password. 
my password? Out with it! You see, the attitude to the question depends on the situation and also the pretext for the conversation. And it's really unsurprising that scammers take advantage of this. Remember, you must never tell your password from any account to anyone. No customer service professional or banking administrator will ever ask you to share this information with them. Now, some situations can actually be simulated artificially. For instance, let's say you open up your computer and you see that your social network was hacked, right? So you straight away call the support team and the call was strangely dropped. But then an operator called you back immediately. Now, this operator will likely have one objective, to get your password from you during the phone call. Now, in the age of IP telephony, it's not that difficult to replace a caller's number on a Facebook hotline. So right from the start, you'll think you've received a call from a social networking company. Now, this is already a good starting point, but we need a very well-written script to get it right. So what does it look like or what does it sound like if they don't use a script? Good time of the day. Uh, Bradley, we've noticed that your account is, well, being used to send out messenger ads, and we'd like to make sure that you're not violating um, the terms of the user agreement. Please tell us your password, and we'll actually check whether it's you or not. Pretty unconvincing, right? Completely. The scammer is too fuzzy with words, he's clearly unsure of himself or herself, right? And the pauses actually leave time to think and conjure up questions. So cheaters will actually use another scenario that will really knock you off balance immediately. Hello, Bradley Peak. I'm Bill Gilbert, Senior Manager for Police Cooperation at Facebook. Now yesterday, at 7.17 p.m., a photo archive was sent from your laptop to your friend Bruce Schneiner. Now these photos fall under EU Directive 7 to combat the distribution of child pornography. This is a serious criminal offence, Bradley. Now Police Lieutenant Kevin Litnick is with me now. He wants to make sure that you are unaware that the archive was actually sent. So in order for us to compare the log and the current status of the profile, please provide your password. I sincerely hope this is just an unfortunate misunderstanding. Otherwise, you will be spending the next five years in jail. Now, that kind of treatment is bound to get a pretty violent reaction from you. Notice how the scammer incoherently talks in facts and figures. I mean, he gives you a bunch of names, most of which you don't even understand. And also, he knows when you were online last afternoon. Now, all of this already seems to you like an interrogation, and you subconsciously want to justify yourself quickly. Now, in this scenario, you are much more likely to just tell them your password, right? You don't want five years in jail. Now, this is especially effective if the scammers are able to choose the right time. For instance, let's say you're coming home after a bar crawl. Now, alcohol can actually impair logical thinking, and it will probably raise the chances of you getting caught out. And not only that, but the crooks will probably know your friends' names and the time when you were online yesterday. This is just by adding you as a friend on the very Facebook. So remember, never post pictures from bars or big parties until you're sober the next morning. And in any condition, never tell others your password. I cannot stress that enough. Now, this method of pretexting is as old as phones themselves. And no wonder, scammers always try to use new technologies before ordinary people catch on to how those new technologies work. By the way, the second method of hacking that I want to tell you about also appeared in the early days of the American telephone system, and it's now probably the most popular tactic that's used among, you guessed it, online scammers. Now, do you know who the inventor of the automatic telephone exchange was? Well, the owner of a funeral home is the correct answer. Now, Elman Brown Stroger ran his modest business in Kansas City. And one day, he noticed that the more telephones that appeared in town, the less often new customers would come to him. Stroger decided to investigate this relationship a little bit, and he found out that his main competitor's wife was working as a telephone operator. So she would transfer any phone calls related to funerals to her husband's funeral home, away from Stroger's funeral home. Now, Stroger was a pretty resourceful man, and he decided this had to be dealt with systematically. A couple of years later, he created the world's first automatic telephone exchange. Now, the revolutionary invention quickly put all of these telephone operators out of business. Let's take a look at a classic phishing scheme. Attackers force you to end up not at all where you want it. Now, a scenario that has played out many times is effectively an email that looks like it's coming from your bank. 
Now imagine that an email informs you that there was a major failure at the bank's system. To avoid problems with your plastic card, you are advised to follow the link in the email, fill out the form, so you click on the link and you're taken to what appears to be your bank's website, where you log in and fill out the requested fields, your name, card number, PIN, card verification code, then you press the OK button. Just like that, the attacker has taken control of your bank account and all your money is gone. The sender's address was forged and although it looked like a familiar bank address, it was sent from a completely different server. The link in the letter the you were clicking on actually directed you to a fake website and someone registered a domain very similar to the one it was trying to impersonate. Now the differences can actually be very well thought out and they can be really minuscule. For instance, they might use a large I in place of a small L. See, it's almost impossible to tell the difference in the address bar. Sometimes scammers can actually use another country's domain extension. People often don't pay attention to that, they just see the name, right? And copying the site's design and placing the form at the desired address is literally a matter of a few minutes work. No wonder phishing is the most popular form of social engineering, but how do you protect yourself from these attacks? Firstly, many popular antivirus programs and firewalls have anti-phishing modules. Do not neglect this. Get yourself on an antivirus platform, right? But secondly, I do not recommend following such links whatsoever. If you have received such an email from the bank, really don't be too lazy to manually type it in the address bar and see what it's all about. This will significantly reduce the chance of ending up on some scam site. And thirdly, any incomprehensible situation with a credit card, do not hesitate to phone the bank's call center. And that's on a number that is always on the card itself. Take out your credit card now and look on the back. It will be there. Confirm payments online with banks that have already switched to two-factor authentication systems. Because even if scammers trick you into a fake payment page, sending an SMS with a confirmation code to your phone is really a much more difficult task. Now, if phishing appeared in America at the end of the 19th century, the next hacking method we're going to talk about was invented way back in 1184 BC. I'm sure you've oftentimes heard of the Trojan horse. According to legend, the siege of the ancient city of Troy lasted for nine years. Neither side could actually gain an advantage. The attacking Greeks found the city's walls impenetrable, and the Trojans were too few in numbers to actually overcome the enemy in the end. The siege could have dragged on forever, but the cunning Odysseus came up with a fraudulent solution. The Greeks built a huge horse out of wood, and they retreated from Troy, leaving this horse behind as a gift for the gods. Celebrating their new victory, the Trojans rolled this wooden horse back into their city. During the night, the soldiers, hidden inside the horse, snuck out, and they opened the city gates to allow the entire Greek force to swarm in. This is, of course, a metaphor for the hacking method that's successfully used nowadays all over the world. Only instead of a wooden horse, scammers are using emails or messages containing various attachments with viruses or links to websites with malicious code. So we're now actually going to see if this method works. I'm actually going to send my friends a simple message, right? Do you have any idea who posted this video of me? And then I'm going to add a link but this link won't lead to YouTube or Facebook, right? For each email, I'll actually create my own note on the PrivNote website. Now, this actually lets you send private notes that self-destruct as soon as they're read by the intended recipient. They're mostly used to share passwords or other confidential information, but for me, they'll effectively serve as a signal. If the note vanishes, we'll know that my friend clicked on the link, right? Now, I'm going to disguise the site's address using something called BitDo URL Shortener. Now, you can't really tell where this link leads, as you can imagine, right? Okay, this looks all set. Now, I'm going to send the links to a dozen of my acquaintances. And in a couple of hours, I'll actually check how many of these notes have been destroyed. And I'll know how many of my friends have clicked on my link. So I just came back from lunch and it's an hour and a bit later and this experiment has already showed two things. First of all, my friends spend way too much time on the internet, right? And secondly, yes, even this simple trick worked on them. 11 notes had self-destructed an hour later and there was only one person that I sent this to that didn't read the message. But look, how can you protect yourself against Trojan threats? 
We'll first of all scan all of the files you receive with your antivirus software. If you're using Windows, please tell me you've got something. <laughs> please. If not, go download McAfee or Kaspersky or something right now, right? Just Google antivirus software. You'll find a million results. Anyway, secondly, you need to pay attention to their extensions. That is the extensions on the file. If you've received an image with .exe on the end, you should definitely not open it, no matter what. Also, watch out for shortened links that look a bit suspicious and don't actually follow these unless it's really absolutely necessary. If you do end up clicking on one of these fraudulent, dodgy links by mistake, don't trust the content that they show. It is probably very fraudulent. <laughs> Guys, technology is changing very quickly. Before we knew it, rotary dial phones were changing to push button ones and then the first mobile phones appeared, right, with their big blocky formats and they looked and weighed like a few bricks, right? But then in a matter of years after that, they transformed to these smartphones that fit in our hand and were light and you could touch them, right? Email subsequently burst into our life and then the internet that gave way to social networks and instant messengers and now, God, it seems like I've got master TikTok as well. <laughs> so yes, technology is still evolving at that astonishing pace, but people are remaining the same. They are as easily fooled as they were back in the days of Elman, Stroger, Graham Bell, or even Odysseus, right? And scammers are undoubtedly using it to their advantage. So stay alert. Don't trust anyone in the online jungle, apart from your guide, Bradley. I'd like to end with one more quote by Bruce Schneiner. In terms of safety, the mathematical apparatus is flawless. Computers are vulnerable, networks are generally lousy, and people are just discussing. That's it for today. I'm Bradley. This has been SumSub. Take care. See you in the next video.